All right. Just to me, this is not just another nation. It is not just one of the family of nations. This is a nation with a great mission to perform for the benefit of liberty-loving people everywhere. That we shall be as a city upon a hill. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. You've come to fight as free men. Free men you are. What will you do without freedom? Proclaim liberty throughout all the land. In one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. You gotta fight! Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another edition of Real News in the Morning. I just hit the volume button on my uh, headphones down. It told me volume max. That's what I'm talking about. We are on max overdrive everything this morning, buddy. Uh, what's up, everyone? Bobby's in the Facebook here. See my buddy John Chandler. Uh, Gabby's here. Rick's up in here. Got a packed house in the Facebook. Also streaming on YouTube. Make sure to check us out there. All of our affiliate links and whatnot. My boy uh, Shine on the other side of the, of the aisle here. <laughs> That's not the best way to say that. Other side of the, on the other side, other side of the screen. He's the one that does a great job putting all this stuff together. And there's a whole team of people that do a great job of uh, keeping his stock filled with content. Just search Real News Radio for pretty much anything you're on. You can see it at the top of the scroll bar there. Our uh, Twitter, or Facebook, or YouTube, any of that stuff. Uh, Judy says Granny's here. John says Good morning, folks. What's up? What's up, everybody? Let's start it. Let's start it right this morning. Greatest audience in the nation appreciation segment here. Uh, tell us what you're thankful for. Tell us what you're appreciative of this morning. Tell us what you need help with, man. Y'all need some prayer concerns for anything. You know anybody else that has some prayer concerns about anything. Uh, just let us know. Keep us up to date with that stuff. If you have any businesses, actually leading into one of the stories we're going to be covering right now, some of the unemployment claims. But uh, if you have any businesses that are trying to innovate, that want to stay relevant or vital or whatever else, man, let us know. We'll bring them on the program. We'll try and get this message out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oop, just got a message on Facebook. going to be right back. But we are back, Shine. So let us know how that stuff is going in your life, what you're thankful for, what you need help with, bring this community together. Uh, Shine, I'll also say too, a bit of an update with that one uh, from the Sentinel group, if everyone can keep this person in their mind. Um, I don't wanna put this person's name out there, but we did have someone from our Sentinel group out here in the middle Tennessee area that had to be put into a, a forced medical coma to deal with some of the coronavirus situation. Um, seems like that is, is going about as well as you could possibly hope for. His wife also has come down with some symptoms as well, but not nearly as bad as, as he is. Uh, so keep them in their prayers. Um, at least the information I'm getting so far as the doctors are saying that, that, that it's certainly hopeful at this point. Um, uh, so anyways, just keep that individual in your prayers uh, for right now. And obviously I would say, uh, you know, creep uh, anybody else in your prayers for two for businesses that are going on that need some help during these times. Uh, quick update in some coronavirus numbers. Though, but wait, 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 before you jump in, before you get yeah. going, yeah, yeah. you know, we should always do before we get heavy. We should always like you know banter a little bit and have a little fun. But, uh, you ask the audience. Let's be a good example to our audience. We ask them to mention things they're thankful for. Oh, we should yeah, yeah. we should mention things we're thankful for. At least one thing each. We try to do that once a week. It's a good good thing to do. So, not to put you on the spot, Mister Henry, but what are you so thankful for? Well, look, I don't want to be so too terribly cliche here. And I know prefacing it with that is actually cliche in and of itself, but that's fine, whatever. But I, I think if I have to say anything, it's obviously that I'm thankful for my wife over here. You know, we live in uh, we live out in the Franklin area and, and this uh, the place we live in is not the largest place that we've ever lived in before. So we're sort of right on top of each other. And she's been able to deal with me and my 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 leaning towards hypochondria and not letting anybody go out without being you know properly sanitized and all sort of nonsense. And I'm sure it's a lot sometimes to deal with especially myself i mean you can see the personality that i am already right this is <laughs> you're doing a great job this, think about this shine but for 24 hours a day seven days a week you know what I mean? right right <laughs> yeah right so uh so now if i'm thankful of anything it's obviously for with uh, of her i think this whole period has brought us close together than uh, arguably i think we've we've been in the past and that's what i think that's what periods of, of uh of crisis and, and turmoil and strife and struggle do they if you work through them in the proper way and you fixate yourself on, on a common goal for us, it's God, a common objective, 
you get this triangle analogy going on where her she's here i'm here for working on the same goal we inevitably pull ourselves towards each other right you know what i'm saying just pull yourself towards a common goal i think it works out well but i'm thankful for her what about you buddy um well just so i don't look like i'm not thankful for my significant other i'm also (laughs) i'll throw out there that uh i'm thankful for my fiance she's amazing katie does um you know, without her, I probably wouldn't be eating regularly right now. Cause I get when I yeah, when yeah. I'm like really intense, you know, when I'm when I'm really intense and stuff, I'm like, oh, I'll get to that meal later. You know, she's like, gotta eat, gotta stay healthy, you know. But I'm really <laughs> thankful for her, uh, and I'm thankful for my friends. Like right now, like uh, I've, I've spent the past couple of days talking to some good friends for a long time on the phone and um, catching up and doing all that stuff, and I'm thankful for that today but we'd love to hear from you in the comments uh what you're thankful for i thought it'd be a nice way to start the show especially since we're about to start you were just about to jump into um, what i'm assuming were death numbers uh not not like any other kind of numbers so i thought it might be good to talk about something positive well, first no it's that's a good point man because i did have a positive story coming up here of a, of a new version of jolene coming from dolly Parton. we should so totally cover that right? we should totally let's cover go. that that should have been the lead dolly Parton joins the coronavirus hand-washing propaganda fight that's uh and uh, let's see we got zach on facebook now here too john says that he's thankful for uh, technology that allows us to maintain the sense of community that's what i'm talking about buddy that's By the really way, here's nice another, that's really here's, nice <laughs> here's another thing we're talking about is uh is dolly parton here coming out with a new version of jolene it's uh it's a version that helps us remember how long to wash our hands for here's the good old dolly parton tennessee tried and true let's listen to her well hey there i'm in here in my bubble making bubbles washing my hands you know you gotta wash them for at least 20 seconds we're gonna talk to you a minute so i'll keep the water on low so we don't waste water either anyway i was just thinking what do i do to pass the time during these times i was saying jolene jolene Jolene, Jolene, I'm begging of you, please don't touch my man. <laughs> Jolene, 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 if you touch him, please go wash your hands. There it is, right? Let's see what you can say. <laughs> That's for about a minute, ain't it? Not 20 seconds. But let my hands are clean. I'm going to wash your soap off. You be safe. There you go. Dolly Parton, new version of Jolene, Shan. That's what I'm talking about, right? I love it, sir. <laughs> hey, look, and, and hmm. Right? Yeah, and conversely, we have a story coming out uh, yesterday, I think, from Ellen. Well, she's getting ripped up and down for, maybe not justifiably so, but it's, uh, you're somehow equating being stuck in her multi, multi, multi million dollar mansion to like a prison sentence or something, right? And I think the point that Shine's making is not to draw that comparison, but the point he's making is obviously Dolly's just pure Dolly. Dolly's always been Dolly, right, ma'am? Dolly is, is Tennessee tried and true. And it, and it brings up an interesting question I might have for the Real News audience as well, man. This is totally unrelated to anything we we're possibly going to be covering today. But it was extremely relevant at the beginning of this legislative session and right before this, this uh, whole co- you know, coronavirus outbreak sort of stuff started happening. Everyone knows about the Nathan Bedford Forrest um, uh, thing. Uh, John saying, can't hear you, bro. Oh, you might be talking about Shine. Sorry. Um, uh, let me know if you can hear both of us in the comments section here, everybody. Um, but the Dolly Parton situation uh, going on in the legislature up here on the Hill, everybody knows about the Nathan Bedford Forrest situation. And by that, I mean there's a, a bust, a massive statue, if you will, right up there, right outside the doors. I mean, Shannon and I actually just went to go visit it what, uh, about a month or so back, right, Shannon? Not the statue, visit the, the actual Capitol building, that is, right? But yeah, it was, we in, up there um, doing- it was in mid-February. It was in mid February. Yeah. It was it was a up great there, visit, by the way. If you, I mean, once this is all over, if you haven't done that, you should do it. It's not not impressive. It's it's an impressive. It's as impressive as anything else you could see in Nashville. 
you know, especially during the day. You should go check it out. But yeah, there's the bust oh, yeah. of, of of David well, Crockett too, and uh, David Bedford Forrest, and a couple other people, mm-hmm. uh, a couple senators, oh. uh, things like that. We went to go up there, uh, up there to go work on uh, on removing the the professional privilege tax in Tennessee. Worked with NFIB, a whole bunch of other organizations to try and lobby to get that thing completely removed. It's all there's only about six or five or six professions that are remaining. That doesn't necessarily matter, but we were up there and we we have to sit in the Senate chambers to go through a whole deal and talk about stuff. And we went and lobbied and did our whole thing. And right outside the door of where the House members meet, there's this massive statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Well, this is the question I have to post for real news audience right now. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about replacing the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest with a Dolly Parton instead. Replacing the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest with a with a statue of Dolly Parton instead. And I and I mean Touchdown, in all fairness, Tennessee, right? give them six. That's a brilliant idea, right? From my point of view, I think we had an argument about it that day uh, when you told me about it. Well, but I will say this though, but like when this when that idea first came out, because I, I know a couple of legislators that were floating this an idea, and I and I do know some heavy hitters up there, if you will, that were actually being very sincere about this idea, not just floating out there to start conversation, of actually saying like, let's not only get rid of this controversy, let's shift this to something else entirely. All right, and I will say, as I've been going along and actually studying, you know, everything she's done for East Tennessee, yeah, essentially single-handedly, if you will, built up the entirety of the economy in East Tennessee. As she's been doing that, this idea of replacing the Nathan Bedford Forest statue up there with her is, is starting to grow on me a little bit more, right? And again, I, there's there's arguments that could be made for both sides here. There's arguments that can be made for, like, she's still living an individual. She has very little to do with politics. But the more you get into those ideas of even the one I just said, if she has very little to do with politics, you start start to pause and question, well, does she have very little to do with politics? Does she, though? Because she's done so much right now that is politically related. She's donated so much of her time and her money and her expertise to build this stuff out. The Sevier County area, let's be for real, Shine, would not really be anything w- without that lady. All right? The contribution she's made to the state alone, as far as a resume put together in comparison with some of the other men that are up there, I mean, I don't do – you, you you could at least have that conversation respectfully and meaningfully have that conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you. If, if she wasn't an entertainment figure, you just got you you know you what you kind of just mentioned there was like um, intangible kind of uh, valuable value. You know, she's a value because people look up to her. She's a value because it's intangible to know about her economic impact on Sevier County and therefore the state because of that artistic mm-hmm. intangible value. But from a in a very practical manner. Sevier County pays for public schools across the state through their sales tax revenue. They're the number two sales tax revenue county in the state of Tennessee. And I would say, even though the Great Smoky Mountains are a huge part of that, because they're beautiful, and that's why we love living over here in East Tennessee. But I'd say that Dolly uh, bringing some commercial flair, some... I don't know, some pizzazz to her operation out there and really giving it a lifetime's worth of attention really grew that place. I mean, because there are other little mountain towns with golf carts, not golf carts, uh, go-karts and putt-putt places. There are other places like that. There are places like Branson and um, I don't know. There's other places. But the Great Smoky Mountains and Gatlinburg and Sevier County are special and i'd say she's a huge part of that i think her work has added financially to the state of tennessee probably to the tunes of billions Mm. over the over the entire lifespan no entire lifespan and it's intangible and it's you know uh incidental and things like that but i'd say it's a huge impact and then you just see how people react almost every time she could she could run for governor and win yeah, I see, and that's a little bit of what Kelly's touching on here on Facebook. You know, she just made the comment. Of, she's saying uh, she's very political. Uh, actually, I think responding to my comment saying whether maybe she not be overtly political. She's saying no, no, no. She she is very political. She's just flying under the radar because she's incredibly loved here, right? I say, and she's exactly right. I think she's using her power of, of you know the, the Dolly Parton esteem and everything that comes along with that to make moves in ways that she probably couldn't make moves unless you're Dolly Parton. Right. So, well, hey, I want to see in the comments if you want to see a bust of Dolly Parton in place of Nathan Bedford Forrest at the state capitol of Tennessee. Put that in the comments. Just put, we love Dolly Parton or something like that. Or, you know, if you're the weirdo who thinks Nathan Bedford Forrest should stay there, we want to hear that too. 
you might, and I bet you won't put that in the chat room, you you, you scaredy cat. <laughs> but uh, I mean, if you don't know people, who Nathan Bedford for it is, for that. is, we're not doing that show today. You can Google that yourself. <laughs> We're not doing that show. Today. We're not doing that. Who, the Who is Nathan Bedford for a show today? But you can Google that yourself. <laughs> and switching real quick here to uh, some of the COVID nineteen coronavirus related numbers. Uh, let's see, man. U.S. totals here. Uh, and again, keep in mind, go check the graphs for yourself. I would show these by sharing the screen. I just don't have them immediately pulled up right now. But but the but the charts are showing that we're starting to tail off. The charts are showing that the mitigating factors have absolutely worked. And we actually heard from Dr. Fauci yesterday saying that, look, we, we could actually, and I think Trump was echoing the same things too. We could actually see new modeling data that ends up being better or, or the actual numbers end up being better than that even that new IHME, IMEH, I don't have in front of me, whatever that new modeling was that just came out yesterday, the day before that we reported on yesterday, that made it look so much better. Um, we, we could see total in, in numbers here that end up looking far better than that. So again, just quick update as to where we are right now. U.S. total confirmed cases, 434,000, uh, 23,000 fully recovered, 14,000 deaths so far. As far as it pertains to Tennessee, uh, let's see, we're right at uh, 4,300, 4,362. Um, again, that's uh, the total positive test out of the number of tests in Tennessee that have actually been administered so far. That's 56,618. Out of those 4,362 total confirmed date, uh, cases, we've had 79 deaths. The demographic makeup here is a very interesting thing to consider both by age and race now as well, because you've started to see folks in the like of, say, an Alexander Cortez or others that are starting to draw, say, the a racial component to uh, what is happening now with these with these COVID nineteen related deaths and illnesses and everything else as well. And I, and I'll say this much, buddy. And I don't even know if I want to harp on this for too long, but that issue right there of a racial component, or let's call it a socioeconomic component, because that's what I think it really is. It's a socioeconomic mm, component. I don't. The I, okay, systems. the reality is it's a socioeconomic important uh, economic component. That's the reality. But the way it will be talked about will be a racial oh. component. Oh, valid. Yeah, very valid. So That's an extremely, we're, it's yeah. almost it's 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 almost confusing to have the conversation because yes, you are right. It is the what is reality is there are people who are either further away from hospitals who don't like doctors or don't have enough money or whatever. That's a real thing. Um, but what people will say is, is because of the color of your skin, you're either more likely to die or more less likely to get care or more. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a disclaimer that should be thrown out there before we start this conversation. They well, will say the words racial constantly and, and allude right. to race all day, all day and night. Well, and, and if for anything else, buddy, I, I hope this actually ends up drawing a little bit more attention to some of those systemic causes. And this, and I say that because this is something that, that Dave and I in particular had been working on well before this whole coronavirus situation or crisis rather started started happening. I mean, we've been working obviously with the organization Americans for Prosperity and other individuals in our individual capacity that were doing things. Myself in particular, I was, I was talking with a guy for a while that was actually looking at statistical data amounting that to show the, the governor's team, his healthcare task force, to show them the systemic causes for healthcare problems in America or in the Tennessee in particular. And this is nothing new. And I'm, I'm breaking down these numbers. It's, it's a, I'm, I'm just pulling some of the stuff off the top of my head as, as a sort of paraphrase, if you will. So don't quote me directly. But it's something to the extent of like 20% of the people in the state cause almost 80 to 85% of the healthcare problems. And out of those 20% of people, a certain smaller percentage of those are caused by certain lifestyle choices that are systemic generational problems that you could point back to for a long way back and it plays into everything bro it plays into the education system it plays into criminal justice reform it plays into a larger part of what we we looked at of what china and i have always been trying to work on well even before the company we're working for now that i'm telling you man, i think that hopefully what i'm saying is hopefully that whole narrative doesn't become skewed into just purely what you just mentioned, China, just that race component. Because there is an issue to be brought up, I'll tell you right now. There is an absolute issue to be brought up of what this, some of this data is showing out of systemic underlying problems of a socioeconomic nature that I think are being shown somewhat in this whole, you know, the situation of the COVID-19 deaths or, or the way that they're being handled, health care system, whatever else, right? A lot of those underlying issues we don't have time to get into today. But again, just keep in the back of your mind. Some of that conversation is for real. I think pushing it right now, the way that Alexander Cortez is, is like, dude, it's so untimely. I don't have time. You know what I'm saying, man? 
Like we're, we need to be looking for solutions, not playing Monday morning quarterback right now. We're in the middle of the third quarter right now, bro. Right? Well, like we we're in the middle of the third quarter. We don't want to – I don't know. I think I had this conversation with an individual earlier this week. Everybody is in danger. Everybody is experiencing stress. Everybody has an uh, an opportunity to try to figure out how to get it done and make it and do what's right for their family and blah, 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 blah. There's not a group or individual that's more special than any others in this process. We don't need our people at the, at the top, leadership, and I'd say this in general, not just about uh, people who are sick, but singling out groups that they're more important or whatever is not a good mm. idea, mostly because it's not practical because everyone needs help. The fact that all these people lost their jobs and aren't, and aren't paying into the economy will have reverberations that affect us all. There will be, you know, we'll, I don't know what the data will ultimately end up being, but I bet you before this is all over, everybody will know someone who either got really, really sick or, you know, everybody might at least have a two or three degrees of separation from a death. So mm. everybody's going to be dealing with that as well. So everyone's going to be impacted economically. Everybody has the same danger health-wise, you know, unless you're ge- geographically singled out in New York, you know, but it's a large area. I mean, you're not singling out groups, you know, it's practical. But nobody's special. Quit acting like some some group or or whatever is having it harder than some other kind of group. We are all in, it's not necessarily a nightmare. It's more like Groundhog Day. Like it's not, mm. you get what I'm saying? It's not like being yeah. stuck in in a nightmare. It's more just like something different, something weird. But everybody's in that weird space. It's making everybody edgy and whatever. Everybody's experiencing it. To, for a politicians to point out and say, but what about this group? And what about this group? By including those groups, they're excluding other people. That's the way I look at it. If is if they and I'd say the same if they were to look at some businesses and say, you know, you get this huge bailout and you know, the other people don't. I love that they did through the Small Business Association said if you're trying to pay employees, they went with the problem, not with the um with the description of their group. They went with the problem and said if you're experiencing this problem, if you want to pay your employees, you get money, not if you work in this sector of the economy or if you're this kind of business or that kind of business. Um, but I think in general, doing the pointing out groups, not a good idea. To especially like people like AOC, they do it just to raise their profile or stay in the news. Yeah, right, right. Like, and it's exactly. so it, – it lacks tact, It's it, and it's beneath her office, honestly. I mean I know she's – It is, dude. She's popular, and she gets it. I know she gets it, but it's beneath her. And I know people say the same thing about Trump. I don't know. I just don't like it as much when it has to do with exploiting other people. No, and, and that's dude, that's that's a fantastic way to say it, buddy. It really is beneath her office. It's beneath anybody's office to be able to pull some of the stuff over right now and focus exclusively on something that's not about that particular issue. And I think that's exactly what I was trying to say with it, too. I was trying to point – that's – what I mean by going on with that whole detail that I went on before is like these are legitimate issues of concern that people have been involved talking about for a very, very long time. You know where Shine and I fall on this? I think the proper solution is a free market driven type style of healthcare system that focuses on the least of these out of genuine concern for the least of these. Now, to use this time to exploit a situation to not genuinely concern about the uh, about those issues, but to draw some type of like, I don't know, faux virtue signaling towards something else is nonsense, man. It's exactly what Shine just said. It, it, it's it's beneath the office and it's beneath what's required of these times right now. And I'll talk, I'll say one more thing before I want to get to the story that I really want to bring up today, man. Part of the whole reason why I jumped on today is to push this story in particular. But before I get to that real quick in the show notes description, the description section of Facebook live right now, it's about the second or third thing down. You'll see right there that I'm looking at it right now on Facebook live. It says governor Lee addresses unemployment concerns. If you click that link or the link right underneath it, it says, if you need to file for unemployment, click this link to follow steps. That stuff that I linked there is just chock full of all kinds of resources um, for everything not specifically pertaining to that $1,200 $1, individual check. You get what I'm saying? It's all kind of small business loans and pandemic em- uh, emergency unemployment compensation and federal pandemic unemployment compensation and payroll protection stuff, bro. And it's just like link after link after link to government sites to put you through to get you on the right track if you're struggling with some of that stuff. So check that out, man. And talking about AOC, buddy, 
in these these weird times that everyone's attempting to navigate through right now. We, we actually pulled up a story yesterday of, of uh, Alyssa Milano, who was saying, I'm getting bashed by Bernie supporters and Trump supporters in my comment section right now for not calling out Joe Biden's most recent sexual assault allegation. She can't even figure out how to navigate in these, these weird treacherous waters right now. It's not making sense to a lot of people. And you've heard, I've, I've actually come on this program at least once or twice before, if not to just my personal friends and said before, Working up on the legislature, man, from time to time, you get this sensation and this impression that the D's and R's don't really mean a lot, okay? And this is Mr. Henry's opinion. This is not the opinion of anybody else. I'm just saying the Democrat and Republican affiliation in front or behind someone's name from time to time doesn't really represent the party as you would think. And, and I say that, man, to this next story that you'll see linked in here. I don't know what to do with this one, Sean. I really don't. And, and I need some help from you and I need some help from the real news audience to make heads or tails of this and make it make sense because I feel like I'm a little bit too close to this one and I'm trying to do one of those things again, buddy, where am, am I remaining objective? Here's the headline. I believe it's a Tennessean article here. It's a commercial appeal is what it's coming from. I think it's a little side outlet of, of Tennessean, but Tennessee Democrat Party removes Representative John DeBerry from the ballot as a Democrat candidate. Now, importantly, before I go too much further, what I believe this means is he still currently will remain his it will keep his house seat. But during re-election, which is happening literally right now, I he will not be able to run on the state ballot as a Democrat, right? So he's currently still a House member. It's not like it's being kicked out of the legislature. It's just to run again. The Tennessee Democrat Party has said, you don't represent our values anymore. I'm sorry, there's no such thing as a pro-life Democrat. Love it or hate it, it is what it is. You can't run as a Democrat anymore. Sorry, not sorry type thing. Go run as an independent or maybe, I don't know, become a Republican, which is what they think he is, right? And, and I'll say this right now, Bobby, before I get into this, part of the reason why I, help, I need help with this man is because since I've been up in that legislature, man, one of the finest men that I've had the pleasure of meeting is Representative De DeBerry. This guy has been a pastor for, for decades, man. He's been a 26-year representative of the Democrat Party, a 12-year representative of, of a committee chairman. I'm not even sure how long he's served in the House legislature. But the, the, the guy, man, I'm telling you, he's for strong educational choice rights. He's, he's pro-life since the 70s. He's just like he's a good, solid, all-around dude. Like he's a stand-up figure guy. He's one of the best people up there. If if I, I, I haven't had a long time up there, buddy, but if someone came to me and said, hey, who's a handful of folks that you could point me to? It's like, that's that's the guy you'd like to see representative model behavior off of for everybody in this state, for anybody that's ever elected to a position. I'd say, dude, Rep DeBerry is one of those guys, right? And just to see something like this happen, bro, to, to, to see him sort of betrayed by his own party, which I know is, it's a difficult thing to say because I got another story. I got another story to follow this up with right now. And I'm just, I don't want to bury the lead here. So I'm pulling some of this stuff out as I'm letting well, Facebook get their comments about, around it and should. letting Shine develop some, some commentary. I think we but, should talk Hold on, Chad. I can't. I can't hear you too well. I'm just hearing like an echo type of thing. Um, Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. that. I moved my microphone. Um, but uh, I think but, we should talk about it. I think this is not just a unique in a vacuum thing. We had it with the Republican Party in the state of Tennessee, trying to decide who was a Republican and who wasn't uh, a couple elections ago. So this is becoming a a thing in the state of Tennessee. Is prove your bona fides. Dude, and, and, and Richard just sent us a Facebook message saying, and they waited until the file deadline so he can't file as an independent. Dude, is that part for real? See, obviously, obviously, whatever source I'm reading is not going to report on that part of it. Is that for real, dude? Can someone, I'm sure Richard is great at confirming his sources too. Uh, Richard, send me something that we can, uh, his only option is a writing campaign. Dude, for real? I need to be able to source and cite that, and we need to validate that right now. Because if that's if if Richard Richard always delivers us the hot fire on this uh, program, man, and everything he's saying is usually dead could on. Someone call but... the county clerk if you know if any if any of our hardcore listeners want to be a ground reporter. I'll will teach you how to do it. What you could do is call the ground or call the clerk, county clerk, and say, or even the county elections commission in that whatever county he's in, and say just how is he going to appear on the ballot. And if he's going to appear as a write-in candidate, then it's confirmed. So and it, it's it, Kelly's Kelly's hitting in it's on on the head, man. Kelly's saying in Facebook. So wait, wait. He's held this belief for this long, and now all of a sudden, what the fill in the blank? 
Yes, yes, that's where I'm at right now, too. Let me read some of the responses here so we can get a better context of what's going on. This is DeBerry's response himself after this was happened just a night or two ago where the Tennessee Democrat Party said, hey, sorry, not sorry, you can't run as a Democrat anymore. This is DeBerry's response saying the Tennessee and, – and listen to sort of the undertones here. I'm, I'm reading this, but but just take it from, from what I'm reading. I'll try and read as a news reporter would. Pick up some of these undertones that are being played out here, right? The Tennessee Democrat Party has decided that a 26-year representative that spent 12 years as a committee chairman conducted himself with integrity served the party well sponsored meaningful legislation and built bridges across the aisle to get bills passed is no longer a democrat and so i'm not that was his response bro you know what i'm saying i tried to raise that as been my best news reporter voice that i possibly could without having adding too much inflection of my own or emphasis of my own but but he is clearly upset with what's going on here now the tennessee democrat party chair uh this person ended up saying that it was standard procedure for the state democrat party a primary board to vote on challenges to candidates appearing on the ballot quote after a long meeting in which we heard challenges and evidence we did what we thought was in the best to protect the tennessee democrat party and the values we stand for now what are those values that you end up standing for the vote was confirmed obviously to remove him by the executive committee 41 to 18 uh let's see here uh gonna yeah okay here we go um among them further yeah these are some of the reasons that they provided one of three democrats last year who voted to elect and battled uh, uh former house speaker glenn uh, cassada cassada sorry uh, to the chamber's top leadership position, DeBerry has since cast other votes in opposition to the caucus's position. That's one thing they said they didn't like. Two, among them have been the votes for further restrictions on abortion access. He said in March 2019 that a lack of personal responsibility. This is DeBerry talking as to why he would vote for something, say, something akin to the Harpy Bill or further, you know, abortion restrictions. He said back in March of 2019. The lack of personal responsibility has contributed to the number of abortions taking place. He had just voted in support of a controversial bill banning abortions after a fetal heartbeat could be detected. Now, importantly, Shime, he was also followed in this vote by fellow Democrats John Mark uh, Wendell of Livingston and Joe Towns of Memphis. DeBerry, he's an ordained uh, Church of Christ minister, told uh, the Tennessee earlier— Is he really earlier, a Church of Christ? Yeah, man, Church of Christ minister. And he told the Tennessean earlier that he has stood, quote, stood against abortion consistently since the early 70s. Bro, he's been against abortion since Roe itself was passed in what, 72, 73? Memphis Democrat also voted for Governor Lee's school voice, uh, school voucher legislation. And I'm telling you, all if, if, okay, so if you look at, say, the abortion issue and the school voucher thing, that's basically, and it's not a school voucher, it's an educational savings account, which are totally different things. I don't have time to get into that right now. If you hear DeBerry talk about his reasoning, for supporting the ESA, the Educational Savings Account, which if you don't know what that is, quick rundown real quick, okay? For especially the homeschool folks out there. The ESA was something that was passed last uh, last session. It initially wanted to apply to across the entire state. It doesn't. It just applies to Memphis and Nashville, Shelby County and Davidson County. What this says is if you have a child that's going to public school, there's about seventy-three dollars to $7,500 attached to that individual child's head, okay? So if you want to take that child out of public school, you can then use that $7,500 for your own education if you want to, say, to buy books or college tuition savings or tutoring or, or, or I don't know, uh, a private school tuition or whatever else you want to use it for. Now, there's a very regimented process that you have to use to apply the money and get the money for specific things, and there's been a side controversy with the class wallet account that's going on. That's not to get into it now. I just set that up to tell you this guy, DeBerry, is from Memphis. Shelby County is what this affects. If you hear DeBerry talk about this educational savings account, about how it's going to save his children, right, his personal children, his constituents' children, it's the best option to get them properly educated. Dude, this guy is doing this out of a personal charge, love for his people, love for his constituents, the people that put him into office, bro. He is doing this to make it so that they can have a better future, to fix generational problems, to get them into college. I'm ranting here, obviously, Sean, but I'm telling you, bro. I, I cannot get my head around this situation where – I don't know. And, and let me pause and step back, and I'll kick it to you for some stuff because I've been going for a minute here. But maybe, maybe this is just simply the Democrat Party saying, oh, look, Mr. Henry, I'm sorry. I, this is not the, what the Democrat Party stands for. We stand for public education and pro-choice. That's it. And this guy is pro-life, and he's not for public education. Right. I, I, there's a, qu a great comment right here. This is what I'll end with. There's a great comment in the in the Twitter feed of when this all this information was released. OK. And that comment basically says says this much. Quote, sadly, the Barry no longer behaves as a Democrat. If he ever was one. Listen to this right here, buddy. I think this hits it on the head. You can't be pro birth. What? What does that mean? 
You can't be pro-birth against funding public education and side with Republicans on health care and still call yourself a Democrat. Memphis can do better. All right. So maybe Democrats are just holding their people to some consistency, whereas the Tennessee GOP is apparently having their own problems for not doing that because now Scott Golden is being hit with approving Eddie Manis to run as a Republican in Martin Daniels' 18th district, right? right? Well, hold on. Before so we leave I, DeBerry. Right, and that's what I'm saying. I just want, I just want to put that DeBerry, out there to throw this to right. First yeah. off, the Democratic Party of Tennessee is needs all the people it can get. Because their caucus isn't getting anything done in in the state legislature. Am I wrong? Mr. Henry? Mm, can you no. still hear me? I, yeah, I can like, hear you. Well, I just needed you to verify that because like, you were, you were, you're more in the trenches on that front. Their caucus is not very big, and they're not very effective, uh, mostly because they're not very big. And there's, no, there's just not a lot of them. There's right. not a lot of them. So have, to me, the, the short-sightedness... Uh, and of doing a purity test on someone you may not think is great is something that they don't have the luxury to do in the state of Tennessee. If they had a supermajority, they would have the luxury of doing this. Now, let me just... Th so that, from a pr in a practical sense, this is so stupid. Like, it's just too dumb. Yes. Like, yes. it's just... like. Even if you wanted to get things done as a Democrat, like if, if that was what your life was about, you would call this dumb because it like, OK, so, yeah, he doesn't vote with us on these two or three really important issues to us personally. But there's other things he'll vote with us on, which will be good because our caucus is tiny and maybe we can get something passed, you know. But uh, I do want to say, too, this is just a reflection of what the Democratic Party has been like for the past four years. Hey, haven't always been like this. Just want to throw this out there. They haven't always been like this. And Republicans used to be the ones who were more like this, who did the purity test. Yeah, right. The re especially religious purity test, which this feels a lot like, by the way. And I would say, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but this is politics. This is not religion. You're not voting on your pastor. You're voting on someone who can run a, a very large institution that is non-religious. Okay? That doesn't mean that you should vote for a rapist, you know, or something like that for mayor or something like that. But it does mean it does mean that religious purity tests are not necessarily the the rubric you use for figuring out if someone is a good legislator or executive. What you figure out is are they do they have experience with large institutions? Can they help run them? Will the institutions be better after they're gone? These are the questions you need to be asking. And I would say that to someone at their church who was like, well, did you hear he's been married twice? And it's like, well, I don't care. I'm not voting for a pastor. I'm voting for an executive or someone who's helping write the laws. And even though this is not overtly religious, it is. Because with a lot of these Democrats, they're without that grand meta narrative of a religion of some kind, in the place of that, they have statism, even if it's like they don't even realize it. In the place of, in that place in your brain, because you have a place in your brain that <laughs> is ready to go for religion, that's firing whether you believe in God or not. And a lot of people put that space into government, and the Democrats are the are are the ones who are doing it now. And I don't understand these religious purity tests for people especially when they're in a losing situation. And I think it mm -hmm. speaks to where Democrats are culturally right now, which is probably the right place for them to be. This is me kind of making a turn a little bit. I think even though I disagree with what these particular Democrats in Tennessee are doing, I do feel like the mission of their party should not be winning the White House because that's obviously not happening. That's not, hap <laughs> that's not happening. We'll get to Bernie Sanders in a little bit. But what they right. could, what they could, what they could be spending their time on is something they should have been doing in 2017 and 18, which is who are we? Mm -hmm. What is our message? What are we about? And that's going to take some fighting and some push and pull. And so, in a way, in the state of Tennessee, it's very impractical, but uh, because there's so low numbers anyway. But they are more about figuring out and should be more about figuring out who they are and what they're about than winning. And if you think about it and think about everything that's been going on the past couple of years, you know that what I'm saying is true. They've been more about being correct 
which in a way than winning more about being correct than winning which in a way is kind of respectable it's just they haven't been trying to figure out who they are in so long that they're fumbling about and it looks it looks awkward it looks right whatever but you have to do things awkwardly before you do them well i mean look at what the republican party looked at looked like from like 2008 to 2014 it was a poop show Mm -hmm. you had multiple factions of republicans fighting against each other on legislation in public um representing different constituencies remember that there were the liberty republicans and then there were establishment republicans or whatever uh, the patriot that was a thing we went through where there was bickering backfighting um large investments in elections especially in texas uh during the tea party times between republicans I mean, but remember when Ted Cruz was first running? That was a fight. He only won by like two points his first election, and that was during that time. So they need to go through this, but I can still critique what they're doing in Tennessee that's just so dumb when you ha- you have no soldiers to quit sending their soldiers your soldiers home. You don't have anybody, but that's that's my little rant on it, Mr. Henry. Is It's well, dumb, but it needs to happen in a way for their movement. And I'll say for- – for the real news audience, man, that's why Shine is one of the best in the biz at, at doing this particular thing of, of this innate ability that he just has to pull a 30,000-foot narrative out of such a micro story that we're just talking about right now of a single legislator in Tennessee to talk about the overall implications of the Democrat Party because that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's going on here, and I think that's exactly what the Tennessee Democrat Party is doing. They're realizing we are in a fracturing period. We can't figure out if we're supposed to be socialists or if we're supposed to be old-school Democrats. Right? We can't figure out if the John DeBerry of the past, who apparently has been pro-life since the early 70s, is actually what a Democrat is supposed to be. Meanwhile, my grandfather voted Democrat his entire life, buddy. My entire life. Right? And he's arguably one of the more conservative-leaning Republican-style people that I've ever seen. I would, I would, I would actually venture to say that. Now, I will say this. I'll bring this up right now, and, I, and I'll question this for the real news audience. Now, let me just fill this in real quick, too. Richard just sent me saying that it was in the Daily Memphis story, uh, the DailyMemphis.com story. You can go find this. That's that's the one that, like, represented Zachary and a whole bunch of people. People are posting where the story came from is the Daily Memphis story. But it's paywall. Okay. Well, and, and that's where Richard just told me that uh, that what this was done, they, apparently the only option that he has now, this whole thing was done literally right before the filing deadline. So apparently Representative Barry can't even file as an independent anymore. That, that part of the story, buddy, that is just petty. That has nothing to do with reshaping your party, right? That just has something to do with, for some reason, just wanting to get the Barry out of there, which is just a very odd thing to consider. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's poorly executed, and we can definitely critique about Tennessee, but please continue, Mr. Henry. Yeah. Uh, well, and again, uh, Richard's telling me in uh, the Facebook messaging here that the only option that he has now is a writing candidate. It was done during the social distancing orders by the governor um, and that the filing deadline issue was listed in the Daily Memphis story. So that Daily Memphis story that I, I had pulled up to prep for this show, but I'm not going to pay Daily Memphis any amount of money for to get through a paywall, even for a story like this. So I'm, I'm just not going to do it. But if you want to go pay Lee Daily Memphis a dollar or two to read this story, to, to verify that, go find it. But uh, Richard's saying that that's where it was verified in the Daily Memphis story. Man, and I'm telling you, that is just a, a, a heart-wrenching story for, for Representative Barry. And like, I mean, like, you know, it, all, all things considered grand scheme, you know, everything else is going on. It, it's heart-wrenching is probably a bit too strong of a term, but you get what I'm saying, buddy. And here's here's what I want to juxtapose this entire thing with, okay? And here's why I brought this entire thing up as we're getting into the finishing story with the with the uh, Bernie Sanders situation. I think Sean did an awesome job talking about this is the narrative that's going on behind the backdrop of all this. Yesterday, we talked about the backdrop of everything that was you, the day before. We talked about the backdrop of the China situation that was happening, everything with the WHO, right? Today, we're talking about the backdrop of the Democrat Party that's happening even at a smaller level in the state of Tennessee. 
That's what's so awesome about the way you're talking about backdrop stories that you need to keep in perspective. As we're talking about Bernie Sanders dropping off yesterday, a related story that I want to ping this off of, buddy, is, is coming from the Tennessee Star. As I'm pulling this up right now, headline saying Tennessee GOP chair allows Democrat presidential primary voter to run as a Republican. All right. And I'll, I'll pull this story up so people can see the headline here. But they're essentially what they're, what they're talking about is Eddie Manis. OK, and, and this is a very interesting thing to see what two what, what both state parties are doing here, man. Now, the, the Tennessee GOP got in trouble. Uh, trouble is not. A, people were calling into question the timing of which they changed their bona fide voting rules or bona fide GOP rules a, a, in 2017, a couple years back. Right. They changed it right at the time that the Marsha Blackburn primary was going through or sorry, Senator Blackburn. Now that that was going through is to replace the the outgoing senator seat. There was about five or six or seven different individuals in that primary race. They changed the rules overnight. And then all of a sudden it basically was just Marsha Blackburn. People thought that timing was very suspect, if you will. And they changed it to like instead of two out of the last such and such statewide primaries now it's three out of the last such and such doesn't matter the point being though is that what we have now you can see right here is that gary Lowe. okay so gary Lowe cited this thing gary Lowe from i presume what's he the knox county republican party uh he he cited situations in the bylaws saying that hey look in 2017, you guys modified the bona fide Republican rules, which clearly states that party memberships for candidacy for public office requires that, quote, the individual has to have voted in the last three of the four most recent statewide Republican primary elections. Lowe ended up showing that, hey, Eddie Manis didn't do that. Eddie Manis only voted in two of the last four. All right. So as far as your own rules are concerned, he cannot be considered a Republican to run in what will be Martin Daniels vacated seat. And my internet saying it's getting a little bit wonky here, so let me know if you're losing any money audio shine. But part of, part of the GOP bona fide Republican rules are that if the state chair wants to overrule the other rules, if he feels satisfied to the extent that like, no, 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 you're a bona fide Republican, come to me and I can write off on you, that's fine. And that's exactly what happened. Scott Golden essentially said, hey, uh, listen, um, you know, Eddie Menace, I think you're obviously a bona fide Republican. Doesn't matter that you didn't vote in the last couple of primaries that you should have. We're going to write off on here. OK, no problem at all. Now, obviously, obviously, one of the things that is helping this situation right now, and, and I can't find where this is in the story, so I'll go find it in my notes. But one of the big things that's happening here is uh, the certain number of individuals, if you will, that that wrote in to say, yeah, um, he's he's bona fide. OK. According, I'll put it this way, current Congressman Tim Burchett and former Mayor Haslam, or goodness gracious, former Mayor, former Governor Haslam, both wrote in to say, yeah, this guy's a bona fide Republican. Trust me, it's good for the party. Go with it, okay? So look, let's be for real. Eddie Manis has the proper backing of the people in the GOP to claim that he's a Republican. But I will say one last thing, buddy. They also cited, uh, let's see, the Tennessee bylaws here as well, saying that this this part of how you vote in a presidential primary is considered so serious that it's spelled out in Tennessee law. Tennessee Code Annotated 271-115, subsection B2, states that, quote, at the time the voter seeks to vote in a presidential primary, the voter declares allegiance to the political party in whose primary the voter seeks to vote and states that the voter intends to affiliate with that party. What they're clearly talking about is the last presidential election Eddie Manis voted down. Democrat. OK, so to finish this whole conversation out, buddy, this is why I was asking for some objective um, objectivity and to hold me accountable is at a national level, dude, parties are trying to redefine. Bernie Sanders is stepping out. They don't know what to do with all of his delegate support. Right. Obviously, he's going to throw it towards towards Biden. We're going to see what happens to the convention is Andrew Cuomo play stuff. is in so much weird flux right now, even at the state level, bro, even at the state level. I feel like Democrats are saying you're not Democrat enough. And Republicans now, oddly, are the ones that are saying like, ah, well, we're not Democrat enough. Doesn't matter. Like, come on in. You got the right people back and you come on in. And they, I just don't know Eddie Manis well enough. People in the Knoxville area are probably going to tell me otherwise. Like, no, dude, just like I was trying to defend DeBerry a second ago, they're probably going to be able to defend Eddie Manis and say that guy's a tried, true, strong, staunch Republican. But importantly, buddy, he's replacing Martin Daniel. Yeah. Like yeah. he's he's asking to replace Martin Daniel, like the one of the tried and true liberty champs of this state, bro. Like if ever there was one out there that's better, I, I haven't found him yet. If you don't know Ed, if you don't know Martin Daniel, that's fine. We, Look we'll at talk more about Look it. You'll probably even hear him on the show right? at some point. We'll probably have Martin, yeah, man. Uh, Martin on at some point. Especially if he's not a representative. He'll have more time on his hands, maybe we could talk to him more. But uh yeah, this is interesting. It's interesting that the 
this is interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, even the complaint and the person who is in the complaint in that letter, Gary Lowe, and I know Gary, so I don't want to like I don't want to talk about him like I don't know him. Like I know Gary, I've known Gary for years. In fact, he was my landlord ten years ago, uh, so I know Gary pretty well. <laughs> That's uh, interesting. Yeah, right. oh, he's a nice guy. He used to work for Channel Six. He's a great videographer. He's been involved in Knox County politics for a long time. If he happens to watch this video, um, I mean, I'll be really fair, Gary. Um, but so that's really that's really interesting because Gary has run for things many times. Gary is mm. a bona fide Republican. I mean, he is bona fide. He is <laughs> he is one of the most bona fide in the in the county. But I would say, you know, like Eddie ran that election last year earlier yeah like middle of last year ran that that city no, election knock city knock, knock city, city mayor, mayor. Election, right, and yeah. though it was a non-partisan election because we're we're commies here in knoxville for some reason <laughs> and first amendment doesn't apply and you can't put your party affiliation when you're running city elections so that people can be tricked into voting for democrats but anyway eddie manis basically ran as a republican basically like by default right by default a lot of the people who do things for Republicans in the city ended up working on that campaign. And I'd say incidentally, he's got a lot of people into politics who weren't into politics before doing door knocking and things like that. Um, very Getting lots of people involved, probably more than the county usually does. Okay? Probably more. Maybe not. I wouldn't know. We can have, and if anybody from Knox County Republicans is in the chat or watches this video later, send us a personal message if there's anything that I got wrong because I don't want to talk bad about you or anything. I I just want to throw out the the evidence that what Eddie Manis did for the Republican Party, even if it was incidentally, was more than a lot of people did for the Republican Party in the county of Knox uh, mm. last year. And he put a lot of his personal money up and his, definitely his time, you know, definitely put in his time, the sweat equity. That guy was out there doing stuff all the time. And like I said, by default for Republicans, even though it wasn't a partisan election, I think. I think it wasn't a partisan election. So I, that's what I want to throw out there. It's like if a guy's willing to go out there and spend his own time, get a lot of other people fired up, and he's not doing it for the Democratic Party, why wouldn't you want him to do it for you? I mean that's that's my critique to Gary, um, and I I don't know I'll just add to it Gary has run for or I'll, I'll call him Mr. Lowe Mr. Lowe has run f for office many times and not one hmm. so I'll just add that to the context of someone complaining about someone not running or shouldn't being able to run um, that's just I don't know how that adds in his context but I feel like it is. So I think it's fine for Eddie to run for that if he was able to get the petition filled out and he fill, and all the other requirements are met. I think, um, I mean, I voted for a Democrat in a presidential election two cycles ago. Are they going to hold that against me if I want to run in four years or something like that? Not that I'm thinking about it. Don't, don't call me. <laughs> don't text me. I don't want any kind of solicitation on running for anything. But if I did, would someone hold that against me? I mean, I feel like I should be able to vote my conscience, vote my heart, and then be able to participate in the duopoly system. Because mm -hmm. um, to me, the only thing that's dangerous about this for Democrats and Republicans in the state of Tennessee is you only have two vehicles to be a part of that institution in the state of Tennessee. You have the Republican Party right, and you have the right. Democrats. And if both parties are putting in these kinds of barriers, what I worry about is people who are actually compromisers, people who are actually get stuff done kind of people where it's like, okay, well, you're doing better now, so I'm going to vote for you, or you're doing better now. Not a team jumper, but people who acknowledge when one party or the other is doing better at certain times you know what i'm saying an open-minded person those people will be penalized and you'll make the legislature or even the political scene more divided more um black and white instead of gray and i don't why well, and i think it's i think it's a bad thing generally to be no, doing I, I hear you man and, and it, it does you know have something that people need to draw into to at least consideration like they are thinking about running for office one day they need to think like goodness gracious man have i voted in the proper number of primaries and i have, have i voted the right way in the proper number of primaries right 
I can't vote for a specific individual if I think this guy's better for the job than that guy. God forbid he's running with an L in front of his name or something like that, and I need to run with an R in front of my name later on. I, I, you got to vote for Republicans, and you have to vote in the, in the last uh, couple of primaries. And, and yeah, Richard, as far as I presume, is the one that posted this in the Real News uh, chat section or from the Real News account here. Uh, Richard, man, always keeps enough to up to date. Big shout out for Richard. Appreciate you for posting this real quick. Producer man. extraordinaire. Facebook. Producer extraordinaire, man, uh, says this is from the Memphis Flyer, actually. Sorry, uh, not the not the uh, not the Daily Memphis, the Memphis Flyer. Quote: Since the two major parties, talking about Representative DeBerry again, since the two major parties have control over their own primary ballots and the deadline for filing, even as an independent, has passed. DeBerry's only option for re-election is via a write-in campaign, a very long shot. The remaining Democrats on the ballot are uh, some folks that don't matter. I mean, Some folks that like don't matter. Right. How about that? <laughs> In your face, <laughs> other people. In your face. Well, I, I just people don't who know don't them, matter. <laughs> Non-essential. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Henry. I, I love I love messing right. with your um with your wordplay sometimes. I love, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, but it, but it does look, man. And and here's what I wanted to show before, uh, just so people know that I'm not lying. It was a little bit blurred when I tried to show this stuff previously. But I'll read this right now directly from the Tennessee uh, Star. If you can see this, according this is back to talking about Eddie Manis. According to Tennessee Secretary of State, as the filing deadline of noon Thursday, April twenty uh, April second, rather, the signatures on Eddie Manis's petitions were approved. Those signatures included that of Republican Congressman uh, for the U.S. Second District Tim Burchett and his wife Kelly, as well as Republican Tennessee uh, former Republican Tennessee sorry Governor Bill Haslam. Okay, and obviously. Obviously, I think that had a lot to do with the situation of Eddie Manis, right? If you're if you're tagged by the right people and, and the right people can sign off and like, yes, he's a bona fide guy, he'll vote the right way, trust me, he's good to go type thing, then look, you'll be fine, you'll be good to go. But it, it, this juxtaposition, bro, of how the Democrat Party is handling Representative DeBerry and how right now the GOP is handling what would be a, a I don't know, dude. Let's 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 let me ask this real question real quick to the real news audience, especially for folks folks out there in the East Tennessee area. Representative Martin Daniel, as I've said before, strong, tried and true liberty champion. The guy's legislation is some of my favorite that I, I love to talk about. Half the stuff we talk about in this program is probably Representative Daniel's legislation. So being that Eddie Manis now has name recognition for what he's done in the area that he ran against uh, now city mayor Ken Cannon. What do you think the likelihood is of him winning that seat where that Daniel is vacated? OK. And I guess that's mainly the question, the only question that needs to be asked here, okay, is, is while some people are worried about the, the state GOP, I don't know, somehow relinquishing out of the, the, the vetting caliber, if you will, of what it means to be a part of the, the grand old party or something like that, I don't know. I don't know. I think what it really comes down to is who has the best shot of maintaining that seat? And Eddie Manis or who else is going to jump in that race, man? Who else is going to jump in that race? I don't know. But what it really uh, means I, right I, now is if not for Scott Golden, Eddie Manis would not have been able to run. That's pure and simple what's going on right now. If not for Scott Golden, Eddie Manis would not have been able to run that seat. And if not for the Tennessee D Democrat Party right now, Representative DeBerry would still be able to run as a Democrat. And if what we're saying is correct from the from the Memphis Flyer, the only option DeBerry has now is a write-in, bro. It's just like – I it, navig again, theme of one of these – of the, this week is navigating these waters right now is a very difficult time. Navigating at the national level, bro, and it brings up what we said yesterday too. Are we getting closer to the option for a third-party candidate? Are we getting closer to the option of the cult of personality dying out and focusing much more on policy as opposed to the last name that's carrying that policy? All right? I'm, I'm hoping we're getting a little bit closer to a sense of objectivity to focus on legislation and reason over the person that's carrying it for me or even the party that's carrying it for me. I don't know. That's my personal opinions because as far as it pertains to Tennessee, man, one of the finest men that I've known in the Tennessee legislature apparently can't call himself a Democrat anymore and probably can't even run effectively anymore. And, you know, Martin Dan, our Liberty champion right now, dude, it's like, I, you know, Eddie Manis. I'm going to be for real, dude. This is Mr. Henry speaking, pure and simple. I'm just going to put it out there. Just People put it can out give me there, whatever Mr. reaction Henry. they want to. I'm going to put it just out there. Just put it out there. Eddie Manis is going to – he's going to have to convince me a little bit, all right? I can't even vote for him. He's going to have to do a little bit of convincing me right now that if you're going to be replacing Representative Daniel – Buddy, you got some big liberty shoes to fill, and I'm going to need to see some, some, I don't know, some liberty swagger, if you will. You know what I'm saying, buddy? Well, I'm sure if you lived in his district, he would come knock on your door and sell you on it because he's sure he he's hardcore about that stuff. He's hardcore. I mean, I think he in added to the party probably in, during his city election. I don't know. That's what I mean by like there's all these like, you know, maybe you don't agree on him, but like he probably added money, attention, and people to the party. 
county party of Knox. Um, and I understand, Mr. Henry, because of the uh, legislator that he's replacing, you have a higher bar for him. That's right. But right. if you think about some of your other legislators, I won't call anybody out by name, he's definitely par. And, or, or much better. Or, or I'll much, give you that. Or much better. Yeah. 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 I, I'll, I'm glad you said it. Um, <laughs> so I didn't have to. But, like, uh, I don't know. I think overall, I think him running is good. Better than someone who doesn't have the experience of running, running. You know, we know this guy can handle it. You know, I don't. You know, what I wonder, you know, on a personal level, is he went through all that last year. He must have a lot of stamina if he thinks he's going to go through that again. Um, yeah, right. That's a good point. That's even though I feel like the city election was probably a bigger operation than he'll be running for house rep. But uh, I wish him luck. I don't necessarily know if. You know, me personally, if I would go out and door knock for him or endorse him or something like that, I don't know if I would take that level of action, but uh, I'm glad he's running. He seems like a talented guy. He seems like a smart guy. He's a, a guy who's been in business a long time and is trying to do his part. He's just, you know, it's this time of his life. He's gained some experience. He's gained a little extra wealth, and he's just trying to add what he has to the conversation, to the community. I respect that. I love people that get off the bench and you know, mm -hmm. who obviously aren't doing it for power. You know, at least theoretically aren't doing it for power. And um, it just, it feels good. I don't necessarily know if I'd vote for him either, Grant, but if, it, but I probably, if I lived in his district, I don't think I do. Um, yeah, and, and again, one more time, just to make it abundantly clear for anybody that's watching now or in the future, this is obviously a, a program that Sean and I do on our own. We are not in the representing capacity of any organization or any other person or whatever else. Or it's candidate him, or PAC. Or candidate or candidate or PAC or whatever. Right, exactly. They, we represent news, ourselves, and this is not a commercial operation at the moment. So we don't even take money. So even no. those things he mentioned don't matter, really. This exactly. is Exactly. And so – this is just just for us to build out this community to keep people informed to start dialogue to engage in the comment section literally man just to live life with each other right now and just to stay up on what we do Sean and i think that we put together a fairly decent program and look to recap all this where we're at right now representative DeBerry no longer able to run as a democrat because apparently he's pro-life and he's pro-school choice that's the pure plain and simple of what's going on gop seems to be a little bit more open nowadays as to who can and cannot call themselves a republican let's be for real man it seems likely I may be wrong, but it seems likely that in Martin Daniels District, District 18 there, the primary is pretty much the race. And when it comes down to the general, I don't think it necessarily matters as much. I may be wrong, but typically I would think whoever's running that primary is probably going to be the representative there. So that's probably what Eddie Minutes is focusing on. Let me just go out on this note here because I know it's 1004, Shine. Real quick prediction here. Bernie Sanders stepping down. He was on Stephen Colbert's program yesterday. The headline I'm reading is that he went just up into the point of actual full endorsement of, 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 uh, of Joe Biden. But really didn't give, <laughs> really didn't give like a, a definitive say. Yeah, I'm gonna throw all my support behind him. He basically just said I'm gonna do as much as I possibly can to beat Trump. So I don't know, bro. Anything you're reading into that? Anything you're reading into? Like, are we gonna have some type of broker convention? Is Cuomo's name still in play? Is Bernie gonna pull a weird fast one on the back end? Is Biden gonna last? You know, with his with the momentum that he has going now. Is does any of this matter? regardless of the scenario, because Trump already has this locked up. You know what I mean? I'll try to be quick on this, Mr. Henry, because I know, like you said, we're we're getting towards we're, – we're over time already. But going back to what we said in the um, DeBerry conversation, Democrats nationwide are worried more about figuring out who they are than winning. Hmm. But there's still a portion of the Democrats who remember that without power, what you think doesn't matter. Uh, there's a portion that remember that. But as an institution, they cannot be about purity and winning at the same time. It'll probably end up being a poop show of nothing where not a lot is accomplished if they don't figure out, hey, we're about, if they don't decide we're about winning or we're about purity. I think that's part of the reason you've had people throw the word hypocrite around with Alyssa Milano and others. Right. Uh, because right. it's like you haven't been about winning. You've been about purity. You know, nobody's given Donna Brazil any any crap about supporting Joe Biden. Right. Because she's yeah, a party right, lady. Yeah. She's a party lady. She's about winning. And she's always been about winning. No one's given Carvel any crap about uh, not being for Bernie Sanders because he's always been about winning. The people who are getting feedback of you're a hypocrite are the people who've been about purity. 
And I do believe that the fight over whether the Democratic Party is about purity or about winning will happen at the convention, but will produce no purity and no winning. Mm. Because they haven't decided what they're about. They haven't. That's an internal battle that they're raging right now, and I think it'll go, unfortunately, beyond the convention and will be fought in the next presidential race, um, mostly because they won't have any power. So they'll still be... They'll be developing personalities that gain power and try to pull the party in a direction, and they'll either be stopped or met with force or win. And that'll happen in multiple places because there's not a central power in the, in the, in the Democratic Party. I hope that wasn't too confusing, but I, I do believe what you'll see is a, a fight over whether they're about purity or winning, and they won't accomplish either at the convention. Now, if yeah. they, But they, there's an outside chance that they could get their stuff together and decide we're about winning. But I doubt it because about 12 to 15 percent of those Bernie Sanders supporters are not about winning. They're 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 definitely about purity and they're more engaged. They're louder and they're and they have more influence than the rest of the party, for better hmm. or worse. So that's my thoughts on on those things. And uh, as I let's try and pull up our, our, our outro music here uh, again, shout out to everyone that joined us this morning on uh, Facebook, on YouTube. You can check us out there uh, if you want to check back later on. We uh, check out the Twitter section as well. Streaming on Twitch for those that actually want to know as well. Uh, just all over the place trying to build this community as best we can in as many ways as we can. If you have any messages of concern or, or if you need help or something or if you just need a prayer request for something or whatever else your stuff is, direct message either myself or David uh, here. Uh, you can also direct message the uh, the Real News page as well, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get back to you there. We will be back tomorrow with another episode, and I'm pretty sure we'll be back on Friday as well with another episode. And at some point tomorrow on Friday, talking about this comparison of the World 1.0 versus World 2.0, pre-COVID-19 versus post-COVID-19. What does this new normal look like? I'm out. Sign, sign us off, buddy. For Mr. Henry, this is Shinebox, and this has been Real News. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.